Church, it is a joy and a privilege to come today as we continue in our series, Stand, a study of First Peter. Today we're going to look at verses 8 through 12 as we talk about stand by faith. And that faith is in relation to our salvation, a full understanding of our salvation. And we're going to go uh, deeper and, and have a fuller understanding as we study these verses today. Now, most of you here today would say with me, I know I am saved. I know Jesus has saved me. I have peace. I, I pray to God. Um, I know that he has changed my life. You would affirm that. You say, yes, that's true. But at the same time, you would say, I struggle to explain that to other people. And one of the reasons sometimes people struggle is, it is by faith that we receive our salvation. It's based on the Word of God. But Jesus doesn't stand physically with us. We talk about Jesus. Well, where is He? We talk about the Holy Spirit. Where is He? We talk about God. Where is He? And so it's by faith upon these truths that we know our life has been changed. We know that we have a relationship with the Lord, but we find it hard to explain it to others at times. Now, it's kind of like trying to explain the unexplainable. Have you ever tried to explain the unexplainable? Uh, there's a story that happened this week that would fall into that category. And there was a lady who uh, had an experience. Her husband took her to the hospital, and when she arrived at the hospital, she began to explain the unexplainable to the people who were meeting her needs, and they just could found it hard to believe her story. But yet, all of her physical ailments lined up that the story was true. And they asked the lady, said, what happened to you? And here's what she said. I was out working in the yard when out of nowhere a snake fell from the sky and wrapped itself around my arm. It squeezed my arm so tight I could not get it off. I began to shake my arm to get the snake off, and he was striking at my face. In fact, they found venom on her glasses where the snake had been striking at her. She said, as I was raising my arm and shaking it to get the snake off, all of a sudden, there came a hawk who swooped down to get the snake. You ought to see this lady's arms. She has marks all over her arm. Snake came down to grab the snake once, twice, three times. And on the fourth attempt, grabbed the snake off of her arm and flew away. The lady said, all I kept saying was, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. And she said, the hawk came and helped me. Now, do you believe that story? Is that like trying to explain the unexplainable? Do you know anybody who had a snake fall out of the sky, wrap around their arm, and a hawk come and eventually take it off their arm and save their life? All I can say is it happened in Texas. <laughs> It's bigger, better, and all kind of things happen there. My wife would confirm that. But listen, that is a true story. Go look it up. You probably saw it in the news. The lady's arm is absolutely decimated from all of the activity that took place on her arm. But that's a hard story to explain to somebody. And you can understand why the people in the medical profession were like, I don't know, how do I believe this? But yet all the facts lined up. They believe the snake dropped. Uh, that hawk dropped the snake while flying and did everything he could to retrieve it. But it fell right on her arm as she was working in the yard. Sometimes it's hard to explain our salvation to other people. But we have to remember it takes faith to believe. So we need to stand by faith um, as we enjoy our salvation, but as we explain our salvation to other people so they can enjoy salvation as well. And I want you to be able to do that effectively. I don't want you to hesitate because Jesus doesn't stand with you present, but you know your life has been changed. How do you explain the unexplainable? Well, today, as we go deeper, we will understand three keys to understanding salvation and if we fully understand our salvation, then we're going to do a better job convictionally and in our clarity to give this understanding to other people so they can have what we have, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
So I want us to take the time today to see these three keys to understanding salvation. The first of the three is this, and that is the confirmation of the gospel. This is verses 8 and 9. And as you remember, the believers were going through a terrible time of persecution and trials and difficult days. And they needed to refocus on their salvation in order to put it all in perspective to keep going. And so he's continuing here to talk to them about the confirmation of the gospel. Here's what it says, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Christian belief we see here in verse 8. He said, now you've not seen him, but yet you love him and you believe in him. You know, there was a man in Scripture by the name of Thomas. We have dubbed him Doubting Thomas. And in John 20, verse 29, uh, Jesus confirms after they have a conversation and an experience that he is the risen Lord, that he doesn't need to doubt because he has seen the Lord. He said, I will not believe unless I see the scars in his hand and put my finger there. And I will not believe unless I see uh, the, where the sword was thrust into his side and I put my hand there. Well, he got to see the risen Lord. And here's what Jesus said to him after that experience. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I've not seen the risen Lord in that manifestation. But Thomas did. But the Lord says, I'm blessed. The Lord says, you're blessed. You have not seen him, yet you love him and you believe in him. That's what the scripture's saying. It says, you love him, Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Many of you would say, yes, I do. Do you believe in him, Jesus? The answer is yes, we believe in him. We just sang about him. We're here to worship him today. We believe in him. And now let me ask you, are you filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy? Do you experience that joy? The joy of your salvation? The joy of the relationship? You can talk to him in prayer. You trust him with your life. There is a joy that comes that it's because you've given your life to him. He's forgiven your sins. The Holy Spirit comes in and lives within you. In John 15, verses 9 through 11, it says just this. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, that obedience, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That inexpressible joy. So what you have here is you have to love for Jesus. You believe in Jesus. It results in this inexpressible joy, which then leads, that's the belief, then the benefit that comes is in verse 9. The Christian benefit is this, verse 9, here it is. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Because you love, because you believe, and because you have this inexpressible joy, it is the confirmation of the Christian benefit of the fact that you can be convinced and you know without a shadow of a doubt that you are saved. You know, the Scripture is very clear that our salvation is given by God. It's shielded by God. It results in this joy even in the midst of the trials these people were going through. And it was a confirmation that they were genuinely saved. Over the last several weeks, I wake up sometimes in the morning and I'll say, Michelle, I was, I was bitten by a mosquito all night long. Or it could have been a host of them. She goes, I don't see anything, Mark. And then I'll show her on my leg or on my arm. I'll say, look right here. And I'll have these big whelps. She goes, well, sure enough, there's the evidence. There's the confirmation that that's true. Now, we, I've not seen the mosquito, but I'll tell you this. When I'm itching in the night and I wake up in the morning and I, I, I have 
marks all over my arm or my leg, I, it is a confirmation that it is real, right? I'm experiencing the discomfort and I'm experiencing the reality that I know there's an evidence there that the mosquito found me. Now that's a confirmation. Now that's a simple story. But there's another confirmation that's greater than any mosquito story. It's the fact that I have joy, that I believe, and that I love Jesus, and that he has transformed and changed my life. And because of that, it is a confirmation that I am his. And our confirmation, listen, it is the validation of the culmination. Now, I'm going to say that again so you can take it in. Our confirmation of salvation, how our lives have been transformed and all that is going on within us, is the validation of the culmination. You say, well, what is the culmination? That is the second key to understanding your salvation. And this is in verses 10 and 11, the culmination of the gospel. He says in verse 10, concerning this salvation, the one that's been confirmed within them, the one that they need to focus on because of all of the trials that they're going through, concerning this salvation, the prophets, those are men in the Old Testament who were moved along by the Holy Spirit to reveal truth. So if the Old Testament is over here, and the work of God within these men was pointing to the fact that Jesus would come, he would die on the cross. He would raise from the grave. Now we're down here and we're looking back and we're believing this and it's changing us. And the confirmation is real because our lives have been transformed. Now he is pointing all the way back to say here's what the prophets were told. And we're going to talk about the prophets. This is important. So that we can understand significantly how all this has transpired, how it's all happened, and how it's changed our lives. And so when you get this full scope, it gives you greater confidence in your salvation. It allows you to explain the unexplainable to other people when you get this. And so here it is. Concerning this salvation, the prophets, those back here, who spoke of the grace that was to come, that's here, that's Jesus, it was to come to you. They searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them, the prophets, pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow, talking about the resurrection and then the church that would be established and how our lives are changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. So let's break this down and look at it. So concerning this salvation, the prophets, number one, spoke. They spoke of the grace that was to come. They prophesied. They, they predicted that Jesus was coming. It was the Spirit who predicted the sufferings of Christ in them. You read in Isaiah chapter 53, you read about the sufferings of Christ that were predicted. Then you look at the glories that would follow in Isaiah 11. Now, the Old Testament, we don't have time today to, to unpack all of it, but it is so filled with so many uh, prophets predicting, prophesying that Jesus would die on the cross, be buried, and, and, and would rise again, that it's absolutely overwhelming the evidence of it from the very beginning all the way to where we are today and to Jesus Christ's return, that all of it is true. And that's why we should study the Old Testament, because we get the full picture of the activity of God. Take a moment and turn with me, if you would, over to Luke chapter 24. And I want you to look at verse 13, and I want to just take a moment to read this so you can take it in, because I want you to fully see kind of this timeline I'm trying to illustrate to you about the prophets, starting with Moses all the way through, speaking about Jesus dying on the cross, rising again. The fact that we look back to that and it changes our life, that is the gospel message we have been given. We have got to fully grasp the full scope of it. Now, in Luke chapter 24, 24, verse 13, this is the story about the two men on the road to Emmaus. We have two people here. Now it says in verse 13, I'm going to make my way all the way down to verse 27 and then stop there to make the point. But let me read this quickly if I may. You follow along. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. 
As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus, now this is a resurrected Jesus, himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and you do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth? They replied, He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and, and found it just as the women had said. But him that they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe. What now? What are they believing? All, right over here, all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Now, you should underline those two words, suffer and glory, because that is one of the things the prophets had to reconcile, and we'll see it here in a minute. They couldn't understand suffering and glory in the same sentence, in, in the same equation. And then he goes on, and here's what he says, verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And so from Moses all the way through, all the way through to the completion of this word being written, he gave explanation to them of himself, Jesus, the Savior. Now, they were slow to heart to remember and to believe. Uh, they were doubters. Uh, they couldn't accept it. And, and they weren't receiving what the word had predicted would happen. Now, what Peter is doing is, he's saying to the believers, listen, I know you're struggling. I know you're under persecution. But please remember the culmination of the gospel that came about from the prophecies of the prophets that has come to you. If that's not enough, think if you would in Matthew 2, verses 1 through 6, where Herod knew uh, this even himself after the birth of Jesus it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was uh, disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests, teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. See, that was prophesied in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Jesus, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Point being, even Herod knew that the prophets had predicted Jesus' coming, that he would be born. And didn't Andrew indicate in John 1 41, when he finds his brother Simon, he says these words, we have found the Messiah that is the Christ. See, they lived with this expectation with what the prophets had said would happen. They spoke about it. But even after they spoke about it, the scripture tells us they searched intently with the greatest care. They didn't fully understand what they had spoken about. They sought Thirdly, to understand the time and the circumstances. They tried to ponder how the glorious Messiah could be involved in suffering that would result in glory. Now, what that saying is, the prophets were moved along by the Spirit. They were given this message about Christ coming. 
They knew he would suffer, but then they knew after the suffering there would be glory, and they couldn't reconcile it. That's all that was given to them. So they searched intently. They studied intently. They wanted to understand this. We're going to see in a moment too that angels long to look into this glorious and gracious and merciful salvation that we have received. Now as you take all this in, you should be understanding that your salvation is rich. You should be understanding that it has been prophesied from the very beginning that salvation was coming in Jesus and it came. And not only did it come, you have looked back by faith and believed it, and it has changed your life. And now that your life is changed, what do you do with it? How do you explain it to other people? Explain the unexplainable because Jesus is not with you. You've been commissioned to give this to other people. What? Everything from all the way back that came to fulfillment that has now changed your life, you now go forth to speak about it. To share it with other people. But you must understand it. You must take it in. You must value it. And that's what we're trying to do here today. And that's why uh, uh, this is so important. That we study it. Oswald Chambers asked this all important question. He said, do we so appreciate the marvelous salvation of Jesus Christ. That we are our utmost for his highest. See, I am convinced that many of us do not share our faith because we've not fully understood our faith. It is not really what, we don't, I mean it's changed us, but do we really get it? Do we really grasp it in its fullness, in its culmination? When we do, there is the third key, and that is the communication of the gospel that takes place. Look at it in verse 12, if you would. It says this, it was revealed to them, you know, they were searching to understand all of this, the prophets were, and it was revealed to them, what what revelation came to them was this, that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. When the prophets began to try to search and understand the very words that they spoke that the Holy Spirit gave them, and they began to get clarity, what was cleared up for them was simply this. You be faithful to do this. You're not serving yourself, but the next generation that is to come. Made me think about being married to a history teacher. My wife is a history teacher. I think she's a marvelous history teacher. I've not sat through her classes, but I get a lot of lessons. And we go places, and she'll say, Mark, do you know what that is? And I'll say, well, I don't know. And she, she knows, and she tells me what it is. And she says, now, if that hadn't have happened there, then this wouldn't have happened here. And if that wouldn't have happened there, then this wouldn't have happened here. And then you wouldn't be standing here today. I said, okay. And what she's trying to help me understand is, if I look back, I can learn and have an appreciation Of what's been done for me. And and that's really what the prophets were doing. Back there, they were being faithful, but they were serving the generation of this time that was receiving by faith the salvation message. Now, that was just after Jesus had walked on the earth, died on the cross, rose from the grave. And they were going through the persecution. And so they had to remember all that had been done for them. Well, the same is true for us if we take a step further. We look back and, 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 and Michelle would say, hey, history, here it is. Here's what the prophets did for you. They were serving you. And it brings an appreciation, right? And, and that's what they did. An appreciation for what? So that the gospel can be preached ongoing. Right? The Holy Spirit in the preaching of the gospel, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, reminds us of why we're here as a church and as believers. When Jesus came to them, he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'll be with you to the very ends of the age. We know that as the Great Commission. That is the marching orders. That is the purpose. That's why we're here. The gospel is to be preached, and it's to be preached by the Holy Spirit, that it fills us 
just as the Holy Spirit, this is so interesting, spoke through the prophets, right? And then the Holy Spirit has always had a role. And then the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. He now fills us as well at salvation, and he fills us in our preaching. Peter preached, Acts 2. Paul preached, Acts 8. Jesus preached. Timothy preached. What you see is there's a consistency of the preaching of the good news, the gospel, the salvation, the message people need to hear, whatever you want to call it. It is God's love for mankind and sending Jesus to die on the cross, be buried, rise from the grave, overcome the sin that is in our hearts because we are born sinners. That's the message that people need to hear. In Acts 4, verses 8 through 12, it says this, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for the act of kindness shown to a cripple, and you ask how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. That's the gospel, right? That this man stands before you healed. He is The stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. And then here's the famous verse that many of you know. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is no other. It is Jesus Christ, our Savior. You say, is it really that significant? Oh, it is. In fact, we get this note at the end of the verse that says this, even angels long to look into the salvation of the souls of mankind that come through Jesus Christ. That's how powerful this is. That word there, to look into, is a word uh, that means to stoop down and to look carefully. Like if I was looking for something here on the ground, I would stoop down and I would study it. And determine what it was I was looking at or looking for. It's the same word that was used to Simon Peter when Simon Peter came to the empty tomb after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says he knelt down and he looked in. Same word. It is to imagine intensely uh, and to look intently uh, uh, for whatever it is that you're looking for. It's that same word. You know, earlier this year we took a trip to Israel. And I stooped down in the, in the very place they believed that Jesus was buried and rose from the grave. And I did that very thing. I knelt down, I went in, into the cave where the stone was rolled away, and I began to look and imagine, what was that like? And to look at that and to really look and try to understand it. And... The angels do, that's what they do. Like they're, they're fascinated. They're overwhelmed. And what are they overwhelmed by? They're overwhelmed by the fact that God, creator God, knew that man sinned in the garden, but he had a plan to save them by sending his only son, whom his only son, if you believe in the Trinity, is God himself, came as the son, prophesied by the prophets that he would come and, and he would suffer, shed his own blood, As that very thing that would cover our sins, forgive us, he would overcome death, be raised from the grave, overcoming death. And then people by faith would look back, believe that Jesus did that for us and be saved. uh, That's overwhelming. That's unbelievable. That's grace, that's mercy, that's, that's not religion. That's love that calls us to a relationship. It's beautiful. And we should soak in it, receive it, be overwhelmed by it, even as the angels were and the prophets looked into it and lives have been changed. And that's what these suffering believers had to focus on, to have the strength to get up and go another day. And that's what we're called to, is that message. But is that gospel message more about a tradition or an insurance policy or a duty we must perform? Or do we love that message? Are we unashamed of that message? As Paul said, I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Peter said in Acts 4 is we can't help not 
speaking about Jesus. I mean, we just can't. It's just too great. It has so transformed our lives. We can't, we won't, we must. But we live in a culture that says, hmm, don't talk about that. People aren't going to understand it. You know, the gospel, okay. And what happens is we began to push programs in front of the gospel. We like personalities over the gospel. We, we like popularity and movements over the gospel. And the gospel begins to take a back seat. Not that we divorce ourselves from the gospel. I always claim the gospel. But it begins to take a back seat to the passions of our heart and the overflow of our life and what we say and what we do. And that's tragic because that's why we're here. The bottom line is our salvation has a divine heritage that is relevant and life-changing today. And these truths should grip our heart and change our life as it did for Peter, as it did for those believers. It should do the same for us today. I wonder, I wrote this question down, have I gotten over my salvation or, or am I gripped by God's great salvation. If there's one key word in our text today that shows up in this chapter over and over again, it's the word salvation. It's what all people need. It's why we exist. And we cannot, must not be ashamed to speak about our salvation. We must not be distracted from telling others about our salvation. It's the very, listen, it is the very theme from beginning to end of the Bible. It's God's salvation for us in Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And if we don't take this up, we're missing the point and the purpose of the church. Adrian Rogers told a little story. He said, I heard of a little lady from the Midwest who was traveling with a tour group. And they were in England, and, and they were visiting all the historical sites, and they went into the beautiful and gorgeous Westminster Abbey. There where the elite of England worshipped and there where the honored of England lie buried. And the guide was showing them the magnificent stained glass. He was showing them the stately columns. And they were going and reading the epitaphs on the tombstones and the markers of the illustrious dead who were buried there. And the guide was intoning on and on and on about the glorious history of that place. Then finally, he stopped for questions and he said, are there any questions? And this little old lady with her shawl on her shoulders lifted her little hand and she said, yes, I'd like to ask a question. Everybody paused, it got silent, and she said, when was the last time anybody was saved here? Boy, that's a great question, isn't it? We can't live off a rich history, but we got to live in the present of the gospel and its power. It's a great question to raise and answer. For in Luke 19, 10, it said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Would you look back at verse 10 as I close this out? Because I want you to see this one word. And I purposely left it out earlier because I wanted to emphasize it here at the end. In verse 10, it says this, Concerning this salvation... The prophets who spoke of the, and if you'd underline this, circle this, put it in a box, whatever you do, highlight it, spoke of the grace that was to come to you. Isn't grace such a beautiful word? The glorious fact of it. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, right? We're talking about standing by faith. And this is not from yourself. You can't earn this. It is a gift of God. It is not by works so that no one can boast. It's by His grace, folks. It is by His grace we've been saved. That truth alone should so enrich our love for God and our willingness to take up what He's asked us to take up, and that is to tell other people of His love for them. But we say, well, I don't know that people are going to understand it. 
where's Jesus? They can't touch him, feel him. You can't see him. I mean, I see him. I mean, I feel him. I know he's changed my life. I love him. I believe in him. I pray to him in my life. But I really struggle to tell other people. Well, how many people are going to believe that you're out in your yard working and a snake drops on your arm, wraps around you, strikes at your face, and then a hawk swoops down four times until it rips the snake from your arm? How many people are going to believe that? How many times has that happened? How many times has that happened ever? I have no idea, but I guarantee it's few and far between. Now I want to ask you, here's my point. You say, well, people can't believe, uh, they don't, uh, uh, uh. may I ask, how many people do you know whose life has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? So many, all the way down through the ages, by the thousands and millions. This is not a once in a lifetime chance that a snake falls out of a sky and a hawk swoops down and that whole deal. No, we, listen. The gospel is real, and it transforms people's lives, and that's what we're called to. Would you consider asking the Holy Spirit to guide your speaking this week in regards to the gospel? And if the Holy Spirit gives you opportunity, puts it on your heart, the only thing I ask is would you speak of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that has changed your life? Would you be open to that? You say, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Then would you take the time to study from the prophets all the way through the richness of your salvation so that you will be ready and that you will be open and so that we can stay faithful to the gospel until Jesus returns? That is my prayer. Let's stand by faith concerning our salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.